Ah, winter. It is actually nearly winter here in Australia, which means freezing temperatures and lots of snow. For this tiny part of the country right here, where the mountains are. Where I live, it's more likely to mean that you might need to consider putting on a long sleeve shirt and you probably won't lose half your body weight to sweat every hour. Yes, it's true, snow has not been a common feature of my life. Perhaps that's why I'm so drawn to it in media. I love seeing films, documentaries, games, and even just paintings with a snowy alpine setting. Of course, when it comes to games, icy environments are often a double-edged sword. They may look nice, but often they come with slow or limited movement as your character trudges through the snow, or there might be some irritating little quirk that means you die of hypothermia if you don't stop to do a little dance every 30 seconds. And in Doom, quirks like that would be just terrible. Fortunately, Chapter 3 of Eve Eternity Crystalline has all of the charm of snowy forests and none of the little annoyances. It does actually contain one little cliché common to ice levels in other games. Player movement is slippery when you're on certain surfaces. As a Doom purist, this should irritate the hell out of me. When you mess with something like player movement, you mess with what makes the game fundamentally Doom. But to my genuine surprise, it doesn't irritate me at all. I'd even say it's a welcome addition, given that it's restricted to this chapter alone. The effect isn't overdone, it's quite subtle really, but you can definitely feel it, especially when you're trying to navigate a jumping section like this. It could so easily be frustrating, but the subtlety of it, coupled with the fact the levels are well designed to accommodate this little addition, does make it rather fun. Anyway, this is level 11, Wanderer, and it's another fairly compact but eventful little level. You need to find three keys to access the exit, and these can be done in any order. What I remember best about this level, however, is the introduction of two new enemies, and they are worthy foes indeed. First, the former captains. As you can probably tell, they're basically just green chain gunners, but they have the same new bullet-firing projectile weapon that Arachnotrons now have, which they fire in a four-round burst. Now, chain gunners can shred your health, no doubt, but these guys are more dangerous. Their bullets do more damage, and the fire rate of that four-round burst is so high that if you're not careful, you're liable to find all four of them lodged in your torso, and your health a tiny fraction of what it was a second ago. Plus, they're lethally accurate at any distance, so if you stand in the wrong place, you may find yourself suddenly obliterated by a couple of former captains over the other side of the map that you didn't even know existed. Of course, if you spend any time in Doom standing in one place, you're already doing something wrong, but if you happen to be in a pitched battle with three cyber demons, you might not notice a barrage of death coming in extremely quickly. But they are not the scariest new enemy in this level. Behold, the Astral Cacodemon. Actually, if you're playing on Ultraviolence, this won't be the first time you've seen one, but I'm still going with Hurt Me Plenty. Anyway, as you can see, it's a cacodemon, but clearly it's been on steroids, which have had the unfortunate effect of turning it grey, and the even more unfortunate effect of making it faster, angrier, and capable of firing multiple projectiles. They are nasty with a capital NA. They may even surpass the Archfile as the most pants-crappingly terrifying monster in this version of the game, and be an even higher priority target, depending on the situation. I still think the Nightmare Demons have the scariest sound effects, but gameplay-wise, these things are even more of a nightmare. The way they can lunge towards you, their speed, the sheer amount of damage they can throw out, these things make them a truly lethal foe. The only good thing about them is their relative fragility. They may have less health even than a regular Cacodemon, so if your aim is good and your nerve is strong, they can be disposed of quickly. Just don't let them get close or you'll be scraping your own entrails off the floor, and the walls, and the ceiling, and a small tree a mile away. Also in their favour is their scarcity. You won't come across too many of them in Eve Eternity, and very rarely will you encounter more than one at a time. Which is good, they're just evil. And apparently this is the nerfed version, as they were originally even nastier, to the point they just overshadowed everything else in the game. I'm glad I never got to meet that version. On to level 12, Brisk. But before that, there are a few more words for you to read. Undoing. Undying. Unmaking. This is a more linear level than the last, as it moves from an icy ravine into a gothic mansion not too dissimilar from the architecture featured in the first chapter. Now, let me ask, what do you think of this whole snowy aesthetic? Well, what do you say? Come on, it's a simple question, are you going to answer or not? Fine, be that way. I only ask because, on the whole, I'm not quite sure how I feel about it. I've already said that I love snowy landscapes in games and other media, and that's true, plus the falling snow is a really interesting and unusual addition to the Doom engine. But is this whole style a good fit for Doom? I'm not so sure. 
It's perhaps just a bit too bright, a bit too light and airy. I actually prefer the interior sections of these levels, in terms of the visuals at least. That said, I don't dislike the snowy environs by any means, I just don't think they're best suited to Doom. But the great thing about Eve Eternity, or one of the great things, is that it runs through a great diversity of graphical styles, but doesn't linger on any one of them for too long. So even if I'm not the biggest fan of the snow aesthetic, I didn't spend long enough in these levels for the novelty to wear off, so I definitely think they're a net positive. I wouldn't want to play a whole megawatt of them, but the five levels here were a good taster. Level 13, Pathfinder. The third map of this chapter is a significantly larger and more complicated level than the first two. The bulk of the action takes place in a sprawling castle-like structure that is again one of the better, more logically designed castles I've seen in the Doom engine. Designing something like this really is an art form. You need to overcome the limitations of Doom's so-called 2.5D engine, but that's the easy part. What's tougher is striking a balance between creating an area that looks like it could be a real structure that exists in the actual world, with creating a layout that's conducive to good Doom gameplay. It's a balance that's tougher to achieve than a lot of people realise, which is why I tend to prefer maps like those of Sunlust that favour fantastic gameplay and abstract environments over any semblance of realism. After all, if I wanted realism, I'd probably seek it in a game engine that isn't nearly 30 years old. But ultimately, Eve Eternity is a rare example of designers getting that balance just right. For the most part. There's one exception. Ooh, foreshadowing. Anyway, things are getting kind of tough by now. Not too tough. Just the right amount of toughness for someone like me, really, where I can feel like I've earned my stripes, but where I also don't spend much time reloading quick saves. This section is kind of a pain as the walls just keep lowering to reveal more and more enemies, but you don't have to fight so many of them at a time that I got overwhelmed. Likewise, there's an arch file here, but it's stuck on its podium, and a trapped arch file is often no more than a minor hindrance. And there's an astral caco demon here, but it revealed another of its weaknesses by basically being trapped behind its allies, and if they can't close the distance to you, you get the chance to blast away their relatively small health pool. And then these two astral cacodemons near the end of the level reveal one of my weaknesses by nearly burning my face off. Personally, my face is one of my top 100 body parts, as well as being absolutely gorgeous. But I survive, just. So it's on to level 14, Freymer. This map is another step up in terms of both size and difficulty. It's probably not super tough if you're cautious, but for someone with my unfortunate combination of carelessness and ineptitude, it proved to be a real trial by fire. Or, in this case, snow. There's definitely a lot going on in this fairly open, sprawling level. It's one of those maps where you might find yourself running around frantically just trying to find a safe place to catch your breath and think, all the while alerting more and more demons to your presence and sending them charging after you with your death in their eyes. There are three main sections to this level, a winding, confusing cavern, a fortress built into the rock, and a series of towers in a large outdoor space, and they all link together in interesting ways. In fact, it can all get a little confusing, and I spent a lot of time wandering around, basically doing laps of the whole level, because I somehow failed to see the incredibly obvious switch to lower the yellow key, but that's on me. Design-wise, this is actually one of the best maps in EVE Eternity, I'd say. It's also the one I had the most deaths in, up to this point at least. I said before that it's probably not super tough for most people, but I think this red key room would cause even decent players to sweat a little. As for me, I took several deaths to figure out a strategy and then actually pull it off. This is a great example of just how dangerous the new enemies, the former captains and the astral cacodemons, can be in the right circumstances. The astral cacodemon flits amongst the other enemies with a speed that makes it tough to pick off, and having former captains in each corner means you've always got one at your back if you don't kill them immediately. Waves of enemies teleport in at timed intervals, fast enough so you're always struggling to keep up, culminating in an art file at the end, and if you haven't got things under control by then, your lifespan can probably be measured in microseconds. It's a good challenge, one I enjoyed, but yeah, I think Hurt Me Plenty was the sensible choice. Doing this on ultraviolence might have been a bit too much for my doddering old self. There's one more intense fight just before the end of the level that's not quite as tough, although it still cost me a death or two. An archfile resurrecting an astral cacodemon is one of the most depressing things you can see in this game, although in this case I was fortunately able to return it to its deceased state before it did any harm. Less fortunately, I then blew myself up with a rocket for about the millionth time in my Doom career. With that done though, it's on to level 15, Cryonology. It's another big level, on a par with the previous one, although I managed to spend a little less time being lost in this one. The majority of the level consists of a large man-made structure, and while it's impressive in its scope, I'm not quite so fond of it compared to what we've already seen. There's just a bit too much verticality for my money. 
Verticality is always a tricky prospect in a Doom map, it's tough to get right, and when you get it wrong the results can be unpleasant, as it's difficult to maintain a sense of place, a sense of where you are, how high you are, due to the limitations of the Doom engine. This map doesn't get it wrong, but I'd say it doesn't really get it right either. Plus, there are sections that seem a little bland, a little unadorned, compared to the lovingly crafted indoor sections of previous maps. The centerpiece of the level, and the best part of it, is this impressive outdoor, I don't know, sundial thing? Whatever it is, you can tell by the amount of goodies strewn about that some serious shit is about to hit a rather massive fan. And so it does. But actually, this fight proved to be less of a problem than the sheer amount of health and ammo on offer it led me to believe. Yes, I died a couple of times in this fight, but that was only because I got impatient trying to kill the inevitable cyber demon at the end. Also, word of incredibly obvious advice, don't pick up an invisibility sphere if there's a cyber demon about. But thanks to the BFG, a hell of a lot of cells, and a healthy dollop of infighting, everything else died before it had a chance to do too much damage to me. Well, actually a lot of things did a lot of damage to me, but the health was there to keep me going. Now, before we close out this icy chapter, let's have a listen to the music. I've downplayed it so far because it was these levels that got me a copyright claim, but this track I think should be okay. It's good music, I like it. It's very evocative of snowfall and frozen lakes and so on. But like the snowy visuals, I have to ask, is this really a good fit for Doom? It's a lot more upbeat and jolly than you normally get in Doom, which can be a little jarring. But I was a huge fan of the high energy upbeat track I talked about in the last video, so I can't really criticise it for that. Meh, I think that, like the visuals, this style of music is fine, but I'm glad it's only present in these five maps. Anyway, the end of this level is interesting as you have to walk out over the ice to a stone circle, in the middle of which is a portal that takes you to the next level, and the next chapter. But that'll have to wait until the next video. For now it's time to take a break while we prepare for chapter 4, level 16. Wait, level 16, that means this was level 15. Which means, oh god, secret levels. Yes, that's right, we're not quite done with chapter 3 yet, we've still got two secret levels to go. Actually, since these secret levels don't take place in a snowy wonderland, and since they're technically levels 31 and 32, I'm not sure if they should technically be included in Chapter 3, but I might as well get them over with now, because woo boy, they're tough levels in several different ways. To get to them, you just need to shoot this switch here. You also need to get the blue key, which is on a platform that is lowered somehow. I honestly don't know what I did to lower it, all I know is that it was inaccessible at the start of the level, and something I did during the level caused it to lower. Yeah, I know, I'm the font of all Doom wisdom. And then you can take the secret exit, which, naturally, kills you. So you start level 31, Imperator, with just a pistol. You also start within three feet of a chain gun and a shotgun, so, you know, it's not all bad. And there's armor and a super shotgun within easy reach. Luxury. Despite its initial generosity, though, this is not an easy level. It is a good level, however. It's another real standout for me. And in contrast to the previous level, I'd say it's one that does verticality right. It does present extra challenges in navigation as you try to figure out which ledges you can jump to from where, but it does it without being disorienting. There are also some devious traps here. This cyber demon wouldn't necessarily be a huge threat, trapped as it is on its podium, but you just can't get a good line of sight on it. And meanwhile, there are demonic horrors crawling around that demand your attention too. Much worse is this room just behind the cyber demon. It starts off with an arch file and a whole heap of zombie men in an enclosed space. Quite manageable, even if I let the arch file exploit me due to my own hubris. Then another arch file ports in with another helping of zombie men. That's fine too. But then, then the Annihilator is released, along with some revenants. And this is precisely the sort of environment where an Annihilator can thrive. There's not enough room to easily dodge its rockets, and while you can try and stay out of its line of sight, the revenants are going to make that tough. But if you turn your attention to them for even a moment, it can be enough time for the Annihilator to end your whole career. I managed to face tank it to death in one attempt and made good my escape, only to die 10 seconds later to a fresh batch of monstrosities. So I continued in my attempts to get through this one room, and I continued to fail. Many, many times. Eventually I got lucky enough to get a clear path to the teleporter just as I ran out of cells, so I beat a hasty, if cowardly, retreat. And hey, I'm willing to call that a victory. 
This level has one more bit of nastiness to throw at you in the form of this extremely close quarters revenant fight, which would have been substantially easier if I'd managed to preserve any cells whatsoever. But it was doable, after I died a couple of times of course. With that final hurdle out of the way, you've got a clear path to the next level. But you might wish you didn't, because this is level 32, Anagnorisis. And no, I don't actually know what that means, so let's check out what Dictionary.com has to say. Hmm. Okay, so it means the critical moment of recognition or discovery in ancient Greek tragedy, especially preceding peripatia. Hmm, don't you love it when a definition gives you another word that you don't know the meaning of? I'll leave you to look up that one for yourself. I'm not sure how that name relates to this level, but I will say that my own critical moment of recognition came when I saw that this level had over a thousand enemies in it, and I realised that I was in for one hell of a fight. This place is huge. It's bigger than that, Chris. It's large. My name's not Chris. Look at this thing. And that doesn't tell the whole story. It's a big map, but it's what's inside that counts. Yes, this is a monster of a level. It's a test of your endurance, and it's a test of your ability to navigate a massively complex, non-linear environment. Fortunately, it's also a damn good level. If I had to sum it up in a word... Uh. The level is non-linear, but it is broken up into distinct sections, and every one of them is a complex challenge unto itself. I suspect I could frame this as a criticism of the design. It really does feel like a whole heap of disparate elements have been thrown together to form one giant level, and that could have resulted in an incoherent mess. But in this case I can't really criticise it. All the elements are connected with sufficient care and artistry that the level flows quite nicely, even if it does become quite a challenge to truly understand the layout and navigate your way around. The auto map helps with this of course, but the navigational challenge is still substantial. The demons also pose a substantial challenge, as you might expect, especially since you're once again forced into a pistol start. I don't think there was any one point in this level that gave me as much trouble as that one small room in the previous map, but I definitely died a lot more overall, and spent long periods of time on low health or with low ammo, or more likely both. It's almost futile to attempt to describe a run through of this map, there are so many different paths to choose from. You need to find three keys to access the final section of the level, but of course there's way more to it than that. There are many, many switches to be found that open up new paths and points of access, and if you're anything like me, you will spend ages just wandering around trying to figure out where to go next. That's probably why my recollections of this level are kind of confused, more a series of moments rather than a coherent memory. But quite a few of those moments are memorable indeed. This switch that reveals several arch files is one of them, but if you use the intended strategy you won't even have time to see them. You'll just have their cries echoing after you as you run for the other switch that causes them to be crushed to death. Which is handy. Of course, I still managed to get demolished by Revenants a few moments later, so swings and roundabouts I guess. This room is a rather novel little trap. A flood of archviles are released from their cages, really too many to kill even with a BFG and plentiful cells. Your only recourse is to duck in here and shoot at them through the windows. There are two columns nicely placed to give you cover, but you'll need to move deftly to ensure that you don't spend too long in line of sight of any of the horrors lurking outside. It's good design in action. This bridge is another part of the level that's lodged firmly in my brain. It's a classic Doom scenario. You're stuck in an exposed location trying to achieve something while fending off attacks from all sides. In this case, what you're trying to do is shoot a number of switches which will allow you to access the door at the other end of the bridge. It would be sensible, of course, to dispatch the Mancubi first, but it takes a death to force me to this realisation. You're really going to want to get rid of them in any case, because once you open the door, it's time to face the inevitable Cyber Demon. This battle on the big bridge is a great set piece, the sort of simple but elegant combat that Doom does best. It would be a great centerpiece of most levels, but here it's just one great moment amongst many packed into a single map that is by itself almost a whole chapter of Eve Eternity. Actually, screw that, it's almost two whole chapters, and that's no exaggeration. To get through this one level took me almost precisely as long as it took me to get through the first ten levels of Eve Eternity. True, I spent a lot of my time here wandering around lost or replaying sections repeatedly to get through a tough fight, but yeah, suffice it to say, this is a big level. The question could be asked, is this level too big? Maybe. It's definitely an endurance test. It got to the point where I was extremely happy to see this cloud of lost souls, simply because killing them all significantly reduced the tally of enemies left alive. The thing is, it never lets up. I honestly can't think of any one section that is markedly easier than the rest. There are deadly traps around every corner, almost literally. 
I had to take a break halfway through this level just because it was all becoming a bit too stressful. Ultimately though, no, I don't think this level is too big. However, I will say that a map of this scope is something that should ideally be seen only once in a Mega Ward. Having it as a secret level was an excellent call. I'd also suggest that anyone thinking of making a map of a similar size had better be damn confident in their ability to create something that flows together like this map does without ever becoming boring. We'll be seeing a map that didn't quite achieve this later on. Anyway, once you've got all three keys, the final section of this level is also memorable, although negotiating the rocky path that leads to it is not the high point. This is where those annoying former captains can be truly lethal as they snipe you from above. The final room is pretty much everything you'd expect from a level like this. Of course, there's a single zombie man there to begin with, just like at the start of the level. There's also a cage full of archviles, but they're no threat. yet. This place isn't exactly the height of creativity, but that's fine, really. After the varied madness that's come before, a simple but brutal ending suits the level well. Waves of increasingly dangerous demons are unleashed as you flick the switches along the walls, until of course the trapped archviles are released and a couple of cyber demons are ported in. Battles like this are presumably the stuff of nightmares for Doom players like Decino, who 100% maps like this without saving, but for cowards like me, who are happy to leave some foes alive, we're given the option of just ignoring the chaos and running straight into the exit. Victory, of a sort. Actually, I just checked Decino's run through this level and he didn't seem to break a sweat, apart from when he had to find one last enemy to get 100% kills. I didn't have that problem, so who's the better Doom player now? Don't answer that. Anyway, with a sense of some relief, it's finally time to move on to Chapter 4, Brutality. Which is an incredibly reassuring name, but that's for next time. Until then, get off my lawn. <laughs>